Hey everyone, it's Dr. Damani and Dr. Louie back today again with the Athlete Spine, and we're really excited to have one of our uh, close friends on with us today, Dr. Alex Satin, who is the co-director of the Spine Fellowship and a spine surgeon at the Texas Back Institute. Morning, Dr. Satin. How are you? Good morning, guys. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, congratulations on the success of your podcast. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. And and I think we're Thank we're going to discuss a pretty fun topic today. I think. We've been looking back at some of our recent topics and really looking at cervical disc replacements uh, in high-level athletes um, in the NHL. And then recently, we had brought up a story of Jesse Winker and his disc replacement as well. But I think we were going to take a step back today and, and talk about why are these patients undergoing surgery? What are the actual symptoms that they're experiencing? And then once one element of their symptoms that's often overlooked that can greatly impact uh, their performance, um, and their recovery from any type of injury. Uh, so Dr. Satin, um, this is a, a, a topic of great interest of yours and that you've been doing a lot of work in. Um, sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to discuss that. And so often in times, particularly these uh, young elite athletes are having surgery for cervical radiculopathy, uh, which is oftentimes due to a disc herniation in the neck pressing on the nerve roots uh, when it comes out uh, of the spinal canal and obviously can cause a lot of arm pain with associated numbness and weakness. And, um, you know, when those patients fail uh, a course of appropriate non-operative treatment, we discuss surgery. And, you know, to your point, uh, disc replacement um, as an alternative to fusion has really grown in, in popularity and acceptance. And, you know, so we, we we're constantly talking about the treatment um, but really speaking about the diagnosis and what comes along uh, from a symptom standpoint to, is obviously really important. And, and to that end, we've kind of gone down this rabbit hole a little bit in, in looking at cervical radiculopathy in a little bit of a different way um, and, and focusing on how uh, sleep um, is impacted by cervical radiculopathy um, and how a uh, interruption of normal sleep can really impact um, patients who are having pain. Um, and, you know, our focus is on these cervical radiculopathy patients. I think this is a really interesting topic because, um, you know, those of us who see, see patients in the office and, and take care of these problems uh, always hear about patients telling us how they can't sleep because their pain is so debilitating. And it's a vicious cycle, right? Because the lack of sleep then makes everything worse during the day. And, and, um, and so I think this is a really timely, uh, timely and very, very interesting topic that uh, we have all experienced as we hear these stories from patients. Absolutely. You know, I think somewhat uh, ironically, um, I had a short course of cervical radiculopathy. I had a left C7 uh, radiculopathy while I, we were actually putting this grant together and, um, <laughs> it, it went away pretty quickly, uh, but it, it definitely gave me some unique perspective and, uh, you know, the, the, this project, um, kind of came about, um, in, in a, it, it's in an interesting way. Um, you know, one of our colleagues, uh, Blake Staub, Dr. Blake Staub, uh, who you both know well, uh, gave a talk on the impact of, of sleep on, you know, just musculoskeletal pain. And, you know, he brought up a lot of great, great points and, you know, that I think are really important to mention. And, you know, we, we think of sleep as just an absence of wakefulness, but in fact, it, it's much more than that. And it, it's really vital to, um, you know, both uh, pain and normal autonomic functions and your immune system and inflammation. And, and when patients have, have a lack of, of, of good sleep or just a lack of sleep overall, it can create this like hyperalgesic effect on them. And there's been a lot of studies um, looking at, you know, back pain and, um, you know, the partners of people who snore in sleep apnea and their pain levels. And, and so we're starting to gain a better understanding of that. And in recent years, there's been some, some great uh, literature out of Korea uh, looking at the impact of sleep on different spinal conditions like lumbar stenosis and cervical myelopathy. And so when we looked into this um, after uh, Blake Staub's talk, we kind of saw that there was an absence of literature on cervical radiculopathy. And so I think that there's a lot of uh, different ways to look at, at sleep and cervical radiculopathy. I think just the absence of sleep 
can really impact that pain response, as I said. But I think that there's a lot more to, to just sleep when you're looking at these different spinal conditions. You know, uh, the studies that have looked at myelopathy, they've discussed that perhaps the, the spinal cord compression can interrupt the normal um, endogenous production of melatonin, which we know is important for sleep. Um, for lumbar stenosis, oftentimes when people lay down, their back pain gets better, but they extend and they reduce their canal and foraminal volume. And so if you think about cervical radiculopathy, and unfortunately, I know from my own experience, when you go to put your head on the pillow at night, um, you kind of self spurling yourself because you're compressing the, the foramen and extending your neck. And so these patients um, are very much impacted by that. And, you know, to be honest with you, I, I didn't often ask about the impact of sleep in patients with either cervical or lumbar radiculopathy. Um, oftentimes they would tell you, um, but I, I've now become a lot more, uh, you know, focused on that and ask these patients. And it, it's, it's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting because we bring it back to the athlete population and we think about the types of injuries that they suffer and we take it for granted. We're like, Oh, look, um, so-and-so has some neck pain and some arm pain, you know, their day to day, you know, there's one element of, Hey, if it's a disc herniation or something pushing against the nerve, we just got to give it time to have the inflammation come down a bit or let the disc herniation get reabsorbed and get smaller over time. But what we forget, like you talked about, is the sleep is so important to other functions. And now, how is this sure. athlete supposed to be re like focusing on their recovery when not they're not able to get the uh, rest that is necessary for you know optimal musculoskeletal function and all these other physiologic conditions that are associated with sleep? Um, so you mentioned the study. Tell us a little bit more about the study and what you're hoping to find. Yeah, so this is a uh, a study that we were fortunate to, to get a grant uh, from the Cervical Spine Research Society, um, and we're looking at the impact of uh, of cervical radiculopathy on sleep quality. Um, I think we are also trying to establish the incidence of poor sleep in this population. Um, you know, in other spine conditions, it's been you know uh, over you know between sixty and eighty percent of patients have been shown to have poor sleep. And so we're using the uh, Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, which is a standardized questionnaire that allows us to, uh, you know, look at sleep both quantitatively and qualitatively, um, and also, you know, establish what percentage of patients are having poor sleep. And then these are patients that have been indicated for surgery. And so we're going to follow them during the postoperative period and be able to uh, assess their improvement, um, both in patient reported outcome measures and sleep. And I think looking at this, you know, neck disability index has one question on sleep. And so it's kind of limited. And so no one's really looked at this uh, in, in such a, a focused way, um, just in regards to, to sleep. And I think hopefully provide us inf information on both the incidents, as well as further support um, the, the outcomes that we achieve and improvement we achieve with surgery in a, in a whole a whole new way and kind of, you know, establishing value. And, I, you know, I think that you brought up a great point, particularly for our athlete patients who are, are you know, rigorously training and, you know, they have to have to, you know, they may have a, an isolated cervical radiculopathy issue, but they have to heal and prepare in a different way as well with their whole body. And so, you know, just their overall ability to heal from training may be impacted by this lack of sleep. Um, you know, their focus and, you know, if you're a quarterback or a golfer or a tennis player or really any athlete, you need to have the utmost focus and concentration. And, and if you're not sleeping, that's, that's a really difficult uh, thing to achieve. Yeah. And as we, as we, uh, you know, think not only of our, of our athlete population, you know, uh, for all of our, you know, musicians and bankers and, you know, uh, all people of all walks of life, you know, have a difficult uh, time performing, you know, if they're, if they're not getting quality sleep. And so I think there can be tremendous implications uh, for the study, not only for our, for our high level athlete population, but also for, for all patients who find that they have a lack of ability to perform and do their normal jobs and activities because of uh, the fact that cervical radiculopathy affects their ability to sleep. 
So I think this is a really timely study. And, um, you know, I know that this is a multi-center study and, and you know, we're, we're honored to be a, a study site uh, as well as, uh, as Texas Back Institute. So. Yeah, no, I mean, I appreciate uh, you guys are obviously uh, very well accomplished researchers and, you know, to be able to participate with you is, is a tremendous honor. Um, and I think is going to strengthen the the uh, the study um, and our findings, you know, by having multiple different centers in different parts of the country with very different uh, patient populations. It'll make our results a lot more generalizable um, and, and really hopefully impact, um, you know, both uh, surgeons and, and our patients. And, you know, to your point, you don't no matter what uh, what you do for a living, your age a good night's sleep um, is really restorative and important to function. And so, you know, obviously our athlete population, there's a different consideration, but this really does, um, you know, is relevant to, to all of our patients. Yeah. I mean, you bring up a great point. I mean, the both of you do, right? We focus on the athletes, but basically anyone <laughs> we've seen struggle with a lack of sleep the next day and how difficult that can be when the stakes are higher for higher level performers it becomes even more detrimental. So I think studies like this are really important because not only does it shed the light on the problem itself, right? Because we talked about this being often overlooked, but it's the first step in trying to identify what can we do about this in the future, right? If we know sleep is a problem for these patients, can we identify how much the sleep improves after some sort of intervention uh, here at surgery? And what steps can we take to get people back to performing at a level that that's sort of optimized? But yeah, Dr. Satin, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it, it's been sort of fun to see you again virtually. And I know we'll reconnect soon in person at one of our conferences. Uh, but it's always it's always great to talk with you. Likewise, thank you for having me. And uh, hopefully uh, uh, get to see you guys in person soon. Absolutely. All right. Until next time, uh, be sure to like and subscribe and follow us on Instagram. Um, take care, everybody. Have a good one. See you later.